Hello and welcome, I'm your CodeMucky. Here let's do a code review on a beginner's code in order to see how it can be improved. So this was a student that emailed me saying, I recently found your Learn C Sharp course. I've just completed the beginner section, really enjoyed learning from it. Thank you for making such a clear, motivating course. I've been practicing by writing some code myself based on what I've learned. So can you take a look at my script and see anything that I can improve? And I have to say, normally when I receive an email like this, usually I don't have the time to go through it. But over here I took some time. I don't remember what I was doing this day, but apparently I had some time to answer this, whereas usually I don't. So here's the code. So it's a nice player class. It's got movement speed. It's got a rigid body. It contains a bunch of coins, references to a coin text UI. Then we've got some start and update functions and some functions to initialize the coins. Then we've got handling player movement. We've got picking up coins by distance and then updating the UI. So we have just a handful of lines of code. So let's see how this part can be improved. So like I wrote here, so at a glance I would say it looks quite nice. So great job, it's much better than the code that I was writing when I started out. Which if that is definitely true, if you're following along what I teach in my c -sharp course, chances are the first code that you write is going to be much better than the first code that I wrote. Just because over here I made sure to teach some good practices. Whereas when I started learning how to write code, I didn't even know what was clean code, quality code, I didn't know any of that. I really just made it work and that's it. So my first note here is with regards to access modifiers. So I say, personally, I like to always explicitly say the access modifier. I never ever omit it. So the access modifier, in case you don't know, is over here, the public, private, and so on. And you can see how you can omit it. So for example, this one, void update, this is perfectly valid code. It doesn't have an access modifier. Like I wrote here, technically, if you do void awake, it is the same as private void awake. That is because the compiler will basically infer private. But then like being as explicit as possible, so there are no doubts. Therefore, I would add private there. So if over here, when it comes to private, I would add this to all of them. So always explicitly, even though technically, if you omit it, technically, it's going to default to private, at least in this specific case. There are other cases where it defaults to something else. I've got a lecture on my c -sharp course on access modifiers that covers those exceptions. But if in general over here, I always like to explicitly say the access modifier. The next note is how a long time ago, I made a personal rule to never name lists and arrays by just using the plural name, simply because it is visually very similar to look at coin and coins. At a glance, you really can't tell that one is a collection and one's an individual, so I would rename that to coin list. And yep, over here, we've got a list of coins and it's just named coins, literally just plural. And like I said, I have found this mistake many, many times. I think I'm accessing just an individual thing. Turns out I'm accessing the list because coins and coin, those are very, very similar. At a glance, you can't really tell the difference between this and this. It is a very tiny difference. So I made it as a personal rule whenever I make some kind of array, some kind of list. Instead of really just using the plural, which really just has a different character, instead of that, I just type in list. And now the difference is pretty drastic. So we've got a coin, we've got a coin list. Like this, at a glance, you can easily see, okay, this one is one object and this is another one. Then on the function initialize coins, personally, I prefer to just do a for each transform child in container, as opposed to doing a for and checking for child count, but that's really just personal preference. So if over here on the initialize coins function, so for initializing them, really just doing a for cycling through the child count and then doing get child. This works, this works perfectly fine. Like I said, this is really just personal preference. And personally, I find doing a simple for each transform child in coins container. If you do it like this, personally, I do find it to be quite a bit easier. Then you can just use child just like this and get component. So personally, I find this to be more straightforward, but again, personal preference. Also, when it comes to initializing logic, normally I put it on awake if it's initializing the current object and it only start for things that access external references. So over here, right now, there's no awake in the script, initializing coins. This one is running here on start. In this case, technically it's actually correct because the coins container, assuming that this is going to be some kind of transform that is not directly attached to the player, assuming that it is something external, that it does make sense to be on start. But over here, like I said, this personal rule that I have, this one has helped me many, many times. It is this short right here where I talk about that rule, basically the difference between awake and start. And yep, it is just like I said, usually I use awake for initializing the current object and start for accessing any external references. If you follow that one rule, you won't solve so many issues, so many issues with code timing, with things being initialized at different times. If you just follow this one rule, it won't solve so many of those. Then something you won't learn in the intermediate section is more on the topic of decoupling and specifically how to use events. And if events are really awesome, definitely one of my favorite C-sharp features. These help you decouple your code with so much ease. So like I wrote here, so ideally your player script should not be tightly coupled with your UI. The player should work regardless of whether UI exists or not. So the UI should exist in a separate script that lists to an event on the player. That event, for example, on coin amount change, and then the UI updates itself when that event is fired. So over here in this script, we've got the coin text. This is a TextMess Pro U GUI. So this is a UI element. And this one over here is basically being updated directly over here. So there's a function update coin UI, and this one is directly updating the text. Whereas instead of this, you should really define event. So public event using the event handler, just because that's the C sharp standard. You don't have to, you can use whatever delegate you want. Then on coin amount changed, just define this event right here. And then when the coin amount changes, like over here, increment the coin, really just invoking this event using this event args.empty, and then instead of manually updating the coin UI, instead of that, this should not be here at all. 
Again, the player should not be responsible for updating the UI. It should work whether the UI exists or not. Instead, there should be some other kind of class, some kind of coin display UI. And on this class, this one, yep, you can define a nice serialized field for the text mesh pro you GUI for the coin text mesh. And this one can also have a reference to the player itself. And then over here, you can do on private void start because again, this is an external reference. So on start, you can go on the player, on coin amount change, listen to that one. And over here, basically update that one. So you can go coin text mesh dot text and go inside the player and then basically ask the player to get the current coin amount. So public int get current coin coin amount. And really just on the player over here, we just return the coin amount. Yep, just return that. And then over here, we access the player, get the current coin amount just like this. And yep, we update the UI. So that way we have a script just for handling the UI. And then the player itself, the player does not care about any UI. So it doesn't have any kind of UI, any kind of that. Nope, none of that exists. The player just fires off events and then the completely separate UI script that one listens to those events and really just updates it based on when those events are fired. So like I said here, this is a more intermediate topic. So on the intermediate section, yep, I talked about decoupling quite a lot and specifically events. This is a really awesome c -sharp feature. Then to take it one step further, the input should also be as coupled as possible. Usually I have a game input class that is the only class in the entire code base that interacts with the input system or input manager. And all the other classes, like the player, they simply ask the game into the class for the inputs, and that's it. You can see how I handle that in my Lunar Liner course. So up over here in my Lunar Liner course, over here I do exactly that. So I've got a game input class, and that is the only one that deals directly with the input system. And really, everything else just hooks onto events on this one. So the game input is in one specific place, and that's it. And everything else just hooks onto that one place. That way, for example, if you want to modify, if you want to change things between the input system and the input manager, you just need to go into that one class and modify things over there. Everything else really just hooks onto that one, doesn't care where that data came from. Then on the picking up coins logic, as a beginner, cycling through a list like you're doing makes sense, but as you learn a bit more, then the more appropriate way to handle that logic is to have a collider on the coin object, and the player does a physics query with physics 2 d overlap circle all, in order to see if there are coins within range, and if so, pick them up. That way, you don't need to keep a list of all the coins, and you don't have to cycle through that list on every single update. So if this one over here for picking up the coin, this one is cycling through the internal list and checking for positions. But yep, like I said, you can just do a physics 2D, in this case 2D because it's a 2D game, and do overlap circle. And this will basically return all of the collided 2Ds within a certain radius of a point. So you can use the player, so the transform.position, then some kind of radius. So that will be over here the minimum distance. So we can use this one over here. And yep, this is basically going to return a collider 2D array, collider 2D array. Then you can just do a for each on collider 2D, collider 2D, in the collider 2D array, cycle through that, then go in the collider 2D and try to get a component of whatever type you're looking for. Like for example, coin. This is how you can identify the type. So you can do out coin coin. You can check for this. And then if this component succeeds, if so, then you have to pick up coin. So you can just destroy that coin. So usually I go in the coin and I call some kind of destroy self function. So over here on the coin, for example, some kind of destroy self function. This one over here, I can just destroy the game object. Again, same thing because the coin should be the one responsible for destroying itself instead of the player. And if then over here we do this and we call add coin just like this. So we do that instead of cycling through a list. So yep, this is a much better way of doing this. And over here, technically there's a minor bug in your pickup coin loop logic. You are cycling through the list, checking if a coin is close enough and removing that coin from the list. Now, when you do that, you will skip one element in the list since you remove an element, but did not modify the iterator variable. It is not a big issue in this case since it won't work correctly in the next update. But if you were doing that logic just once, remember how if you remove an element while cycling, you need to decrement the iterator. So this is actually a very clever bug, something that has happened to me a bunch of times until I learned, okay, I can't do this. So basically, if you are cycling through the list, you are incrementing the iterator variable. And then if you destroy a list, if you remove it from that index, then basically all the other objects after it, those are basically going to be moved before it. So if you are going, like say through index two, and you remove the coin on index two, then the one that used to be on index three is going to now be on index two, the one on four and three and so on. So basically everything gets shifted back. But if you don't modify the index, then the index is currently on index two and you remove this one. So the one on three moved on to do. But then the iterator is going to continue. So the iterator is going to go into three. So this one over here, the one that used to be on three and is now on two, this one is basically going to be skipped. Again, like I said, if you run this on update, it doesn't matter on the next update. So things will be behind by one frame, but it doesn't really matter. But if you were to run this just once and you assume that it was testing for every single thing, you would be incorrect because this code right here, this one's actually skipping one element. So if you wanted to do this, you need to make sure I minus minus, because if you remove one element from the array and everything else shifts back, then you need to make sure to decrement the iterator 
So then when it gets automatically implemented, it goes back and rechecks the same index. We have a great job on following the course and writing that code. Like I said, it's much better quality than what I wrote as a beginner, so you're off to a great start. So yeah, this was definitely interesting. It was nice to look at this script. I hope all of you have gone through my C-sharp course and learned how to write much better code than, like I said, what I was writing myself when I first got started. And I hope this video over here, maybe if you do some of these mistakes, maybe now you won't do them anymore. By the way, for my C-sharp course, there's a completely free video over here on YouTube with all the video lectures. And if you can't afford it, there's a premium version with a bunch of awesome bonuses. It includes a companion project. This contains frequent less questions, quizzes, and importantly, interactive exercises. So these ones basically force you to learn by doing. They require you to actually write code so you can apply what you're learning in each lecture. This way you make sure you are truly general learning. And something that I recently added is a live chat window. That way, as you're going through the course, you can ask for my help. I try to be online as much as possible to answer your questions as quickly as you have them. And if you're interested in the premium version, then right now you can pick up the Black Friday bundle. For just a little bit more, you get not just a C-Shop course, but all my other courses. Alright, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.